you just you just tell me when you're <laughs> sorry. Are you done working now? Um yes. Life of a small business owner, you're always always working. There's always something. There's always something. I'm just I'm always behind. So far behind. It doesn't matter. It's just like when like when do I stop today? Pretty much. Do I keep going forever or not forever? It's just your dad would always tell me it's like you are working and you you get through one wall just to find like ten more walls behind it. You're like, oh god. All right, let's start the show, Nick. Okay, let's do it. Hey everybody, welcome to Full Green Podcast. I'm here with Nick Corween. My name is Phil Callis. Nick. Hello. Philip. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How okay, are you doing? Cool. cool. We're cool. back on a regular podcast. Yeah, let's do Schedule this. Schedule for the last two weeks. I get a lot of questions about hide types, animals, horses, bovine, exotics. I even made a video about this comparing deer hide to chill cordovan and horse fronts, horse butts. Can you break down, perhaps, some of the characteristics of each of the animal hide types and why you would use one over another? My my experience is pretty limited in that, just to like to what we do at our place. I have like a little bit of an understanding as to other things that that are out there in the world, but they're, I mean, a physical properties and then appearance. Like those are the two. Those are the two things that change when you move from raw material to raw material. So the the coarseness of the hair will affect the grain. So how pronounced the grain is or how fine the grain is. And then I guess just the nature of the animal itself and where where it's from on the, the specific hide affects the performance and the thickness and and all that stuff. So there's I mean there's kind of like a spectrum that exists where you th- Think about something that's very fine grain, like a calf skin, because the hair is very fine. And then all the way up to something like a horse hide or like a deer a deer skin or like to go even more dramatic, like the, the mane on the horse hide. Like it's super duper coarse because the hair is very bristly. When you say, yeah, so coarse and fine, what do you... Just like the diameter of the hair is what I'm thinking of. You know, and that has an effect on how soft it would feel. Um, I think you need to break it down a little bit more just because when you say diameter of hair and you talk about grain, I don't think people necessarily understand what grain character is. So it hair holes on the skin, got it. Yep. And then wider, more court, like a boar hair would be super large holes. Like, would you call that a coarse hole? Yes, that'd be coarser. So it'd be more pronounced. Or like the, you know, the, the calf skin, the hairs are... We'll do calfskin because people are familiar, mm-hmm. or most people I think are familiar with it. So it looks very smooth because the hairs themselves are very fine. They're very small, narrow diameter, which means there's a, the smaller hole when the hair isn't there anymore, which means that the grain will appear less noticeable, less you know, fine because it's it's just everything is smaller and then you know, not as easy to see, and then feels smoother and all that stuff. And then you know there's as you go up, I mean, the like a steer hide has a similar grain character in terms of what it looks like, but you just it just enlarged the texture. Really, is what you're doing. So it's a it's a very much an aesthetic sort of thing, the fineness or coarseness of the grain. Because a lot of people like full grain podcast. A lot of people really are, I think, sold on the notion of hey, you want grain, but the type of grain matters. Uh, completely. Well, it does, I mean, it does and it doesn't. I mean, so, because there can be, you can take a caskin or a, a cow hide or a steer hide and have it be full grain and have it be corrected grain. And the one doesn't have any grain anymore. Any grain, the, the appearance of any grain, I mean, the surface structure is still there depending on how it was treated. But you could have almost identical performance characteristics in terms of strength and water resistance. And I mean, you, you have to treat it differently because the, Absorption is different, and the the texture is different. But um, it sounds like there's a lot here. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot, <laughs> and it, and it, and it, it's it gets even more complicated when you think about something like calfskin having less tensile strength than a steer hide, just because it's the less developed 
you know, thing. And then something, you know, like kangaroo or horse hide being more abrasion resistant than something like than steer hide. Just and that's just the sheer nature of the of the composition of the of that animal. Of the animal. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we can try to use some examples. Cause I, I'm I know about this and I'm confused by what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not, it's not intuitive at all. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I mean, that's the, because you, it's just not, it's not intuitive. It's uh, unfortunately. Well, so let's say I'm making a dress shoe and I'm coming to you for leather, knowing that you can make product in horse hide, you can make cordovan, you can make, you've done deer skin. I don't think you really do deer skin. Bison. Where would you steer me for, you know, dress shoe? To the to the cowhide steer hide, and we when I say cowhide and steer hide, it's really interchangeable for for me and in our building, and I think in, for a lot of people. But we when we say that we only use steers, we don't use cows. But you, I mean that's the starting point because it's the most versatile. So you've got the a full range of weights, you've got good cosmetic potential, and then it's it, it can we can affect how the surface appearance looks how the grain is depending on how it's dried and what we do to the surface. So there's a ton of options there too. But I want like, let's get, dress really, shoe. get really specific. I want like a very clean dress shoe that's very formal. Or let's say something I could wear to my wedding, right? Like Or a fancy business office or something. You know, very formal. What what animal hide? Because I'm surprised you didn't say cord of it immediately, but maybe it's not the right choice. Well, it's, I mean, different. I mean, a cordovan in in the U.S. is a dressier leather, and in other parts, it's it's like a casual. In, the, in like the U.K., it's considered like a foul leather, oh, foul weather leather. Whoa! <laughs> Say that. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, because it's not. I mean, or you know, calf skin is really elevated as like that's the dress leather. You know, it's lightweight. It's it's can be very smooth. It's very fine, and. And so it's just, it's just depending, mean, for, I guess for us, for, for what we're known for and in the market that we're in, Cordovan was probably the dressiest, goes into the dressiest products that we're in. But there might be some makers that would say, well, if I'm making a, you know, a, I don't know, a loafer and I want it to be dressier, I'm not, I'm going to use, you know, a lightly polished dark brown leather that I can, t- that'll take a really hard shine because it's going to look most like calfskin because we don't really do, we don't do calfskin. We try to every few years, but the, we don't think the raw material supports it for our business. It does seem like the grain character itself, that fineness of the small hair holes, in addition to a tighter break on the calf does lend to more of a refined look. And when we talk about the break is how your, your toe is flexing on the shoe and then you, you start to see some, potential delamination that creasing look the, like the pebbly the lumps that develop over your foot over your toe where your toes flex where your big toe flexes yeah having more of that coarse break in my mind is a little bit less dressy yeah so you want like calf skin for the break as well as the fine grain appearance interesting about the shell though you're saying is not sort of a dressy look i mean i think i think generally it is considered a a dress leather, especially for the price at this point. Well, that's the other thing is like calf is going to be more expensive, right? So if I'm talking about making a more expensive than calf is going to be more expensive than everything but shell, pretty much. Or exotics, yeah. Or exotics. Well, yeah, I guess you could use exotic you can use gator or I don't know. Would you I do have very little experience? I I know it's completely different and I know it's tough when it's done the right way, but I have very little knowledge on i mean stingray and shark and alligator i have snake i don't i don't really have a lot of so animal that animal choice for dress shoe is relevant but only to some extent it seems like you could do cordovan you could do calf you could do bovine would you do like a would what would a deer skin in whatever tannage you want to choose that just the character of a deer skin and a dress shoe, what would that be like? Uh, well, it's a super, co- I mean, very coarse. The, the, so maybe inappropriate. Yeah, I think it's, it lends itself to a more casual. That in the hide source does not, it is not scalable at all. I mean, they're always 
marked up and they're small and it's, it's, it's interesting. And when they're nice, they're super nice, but that was why, I mean, we've developed a product that we think sort of approximates and looks like deer skin for the sole reason that, well, that it's nice, but also that we think that people want to be able to use something that's like that, but don't really have access to it because the, when you buy deer skins, it's just, it's all over the place in terms of quality. When I hear deer skin though, and you, you talk about it being very coarse and unrefined, I feel like the perception about deer skin is that it's incredibly soft. Is I think where people's brains go to first, maybe soft or something like a glove or a jacket even. Um, is that the case? Is it always soft or can you make a, a little bit of a firmer deer skin? You can, you can make it firmer. That's interesting because I don't, we've only ever tried to do it soft to my knowledge. Um, I mean, we've made it not soft and it's not that nice yeah. <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, but maybe it's because we made it and it turned out firm and we tried to make it soft and it just didn't really translate very well. But I don't, I, that's a good question. I'm not sure why it's always been soft. I don't know if it's because of the, what the sort of intended end use of that product is based on it being from a hunter yeah, in the, in the past, and, or what, or if the, you know, people have an idea of what that should be, but I'm, that's a good question. I don't know, or based on how how the size of the product and sort of what what it lends itself to as a finished product, because it's not making it. You're not going to make a pair of shoes because you're. I mean, yeah, you you could, but it would be. I mean, it might get like a pair for per skin, it would, or or not enough at all for a pair out of a single skin, depending on the, you know, what's what the what it looks like. So I'm surprised know. you didn't go immediately to the thickness weight is thinner leathers in my experience tend to, you just, your brain perceives them as softer just because they're thinner, yeah. but that, it could be part of it too. Yeah. But calf I mean, calf skin isn't always super soft. Yeah. Well, let's go in the other direction. I mean, what's the most, is it a work boot? What's the most casual leather product you could imagine? Uh, what's the opposite of a dress shoe in, in leather goods? That's a good, <laughs> I mean, well, it's, I mean, if you're looking at thinking about shoes, it would, it would be a work boot, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So leather choice for that, does animal hide, hide type play a role or is it sort of all fair game really? Yeah, I think it's all, I think it's, it becomes a performance and cost consideration at that point. Cause it's not something, it's something that's going to get beaten up and used in that, I think that there are there's it's a it's obviously it's a spectrum. So if you want something that's going to wear well and look nice, then you're going to be sacrificing. In most cases, you're going to be sacrificing durability, or it's going to be more expensive. Or I mean, there's there's a bunch of things at play there. But I think that one of the interesting things about the high type is maybe the the tan like the the very base tanning. So like we the we the reason we tan the types of highs that we do and don't tan something like pig and sheep and stuff is because of the fat content. Huh. Because when we're the beginning tanning process, it, you know, we're degreasing. We're pulling all the fats out of the hides and those are super fatty skins. I didn't know that. So it would, our system is not, I mean, there are tanners that that's all they do and they're massive and, and they do fine, but we're just not, that's not our, our system is, would be all gunked up. Hmm. Interesting. And that's, I mean, and that's not, that really doesn't have any determination on the end appearance of the product. It's just the way the, the just material is. Yeah. Well, if you were to do a deer skin work boot, I assume you would have to line it with something pretty thick also because those deer skins don't get much thicker than three ounce, four maybe, depending on the tannage. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you could do a lighter weight thickness leather on a work boot. Is that you're inside out at that point though? Why not just flip it around? Yeah. So <laughs> you, can, I mean, this is we should ask one of the shoemakers we have on the show. Can can you use lightweights for work boots, or is it just not enough substance to give you the rigidity of the? Yeah, I don't know. It's a good question for <laughs> not for you, Weinbrenner or well, we, Wesco or something. Yeah, because I think I mean I don't, and maybe it's a durability thing, and maybe I mean we, we should get those guys on the show. Maybe the the thing with the hide is a steer hide has a thicker grain layer than a deer skin. So if you're going to drop a hammer or a nail or something on your boot, you have a less, less of a chance of going all the way through the grain layer, which is going to give you a product that lasts longer. Right. I should probably know the answer to that. And I don't. Yeah. That's why I'm grilling you. I don't know. I'm calling you out. I don't know exactly. I don't know a certain first for certain. That would be my, my educated. 
So it's something yes. that it's confusing because the word leather can mean a lot of things, including different animal hides. And those inherent characteristics, honestly, the characteristics when somebody says grain, I didn't know what that meant, you know, 15, 16 years ago. And now I perceive grain in two ways. One of the ways is what you've already described with the hair holes, that fineness of the the, the small texture. The other way I perceive grain is something I think I invented, which, which is figuring. You know, you see it's basically fat wrinkles and draw that are... Well, what are what is fat wrinkles and draw? That's not really that's not really grain though. I mean, I know people right. call it grain, but it's more like I think a figuring or character is better. I stole that word from the wood world. Yeah, world. I stole the stole the word from the wood world. There's another time. There you go. Wood, wood world. <laughs> this is the the alliteration podcast. The word from the wood world. <laughs> God. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like the like wrinkles in your skin. your skin, yeah, and it's just like around your knuckles, and it's the same kind of thing. It just develops different differently on different animals depending on how muscular they are, how big they are, how long they. And I see it walk on around. You have the 1940 calf skins that I've been making some product out of. I see fat wrinkles in those. Mm-hmm. I see fat wrinkles in heavyweight steer hides. I don't think I see fat wrinkles in horses. Yeah, it just it's, it has like that more organized. Yeah, what is, look is to that's it. a fat wrinkle that think that that's what people like, especially in the horse butt strips or horse butts, is that like wiry sort of yeah figuring. Well, there's, so there's that which is inherent to the hide itself, and then there's I guess the differentiation between that and draw, which draw is usually a side effect of the tanning process. You know, something being getting Shrunken. going from yeah hot to cold too fast or being too astringent or pH shifts that are too dramatic for that. Or usually it's, cha- usually it's changes in, you know, the, something like that. That's giving it, that's causing it to shrink or expand at a rate that, that is not friendly to keeping the, the thing completely smooth. Well, let's, um, let me try to break that down a little bit too. An easy way to identify a fat wrinkle is a wrinkle that is perpendicular to the backbone. So like a neck, is this accurate? Say that again. An easy way to identify a fat wrinkle versus draw is the fat wrinkle tends to be perpendicular to the backbone of the skin, where the draw tends to be parallel to the backbone, more towards the bellies. Yeah, I think that's... Have you seen fat wrinkles go the other way? No, I think that fat... It's like necks, like where your neck... Moves yeah. around, you get these like little wrinkles in, yeah. in my skin. No, I think that I think that that's that's I, I think that's good. I mean, fat wrinkles I think are are directional, and I think the draw is more random. Mm-hmm. I think it can be. It doesn't need to go necessarily front to back, but it, it's not it's not going to be organized in lines that are sort of in going all running in the same direction, mm. like a fat wrinkle would. I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> but fat wrinkles and draw are natural occurrences, or maybe not. I guess the fat wrinkles are natural, but the draw may or may not be natural. Yeah, and it's a lot. There's a lot of management that goes on of both of those things in terms of what what's it called laying it out in the in the tannage setting and well, and then and then who ends up with hides that have fat wrinkles and who, because it's a it's not it's considered it's considered not cuttable really. I mean, it's not so we're when we're looking at that. You know that's that's an area of the hide that we're calling unsuitable for a product. Well, so, let's talk about bison then. <laughs> Tons of figuring in that. That's, right? That's that's like comes along with that. So you kind of just have to live with that on that product. I mean, that's one of the reasons that you use that product is because it has it. So it's, isn't that funny? So my customers at Ashland want a lot of character. Many do. Many do. I would say from the customers that I speak with, that are probably watching right now. Hi guys. Uh, they prefer that, and I, I often receive requests cut as much character as possible, which is why we started to develop or help, help have you develop some new products for our wallets in Bison. So it's interesting that you say fat wrinkles and draw are considered uncuttable. Maybe Generally, for a shoemaker, is that what you're just- in the in the 
in the wider world they are. But I think I think that that's maybe a function of them not being totally predictable. I mean, if we could if we could deliver a product that always had the same kind of because that's that's our whole job is to take something that's inconsistent and make it as consistent as possible. So to if we could deliver something that was consistently drawn wrinkled, yeah. or wrinkled, then people would buy it because they could they could develop a kind of like a, a standardized product around that. But to say like, well, one in ten might have it, it's not. It's not. And there's no business. There's no scalable business there, which is what most people are after. I think you're almost describing a product that you do called Dearborn, that is tumbled to have a very consistent, more of a finer tumble pattern, which ironically is the one that feels like a deer skin. Well, that's what I was. I would just didn't name it before. Dearborn. It's nice. It, it is nice. It feels. It looks. It looks and feels. What like do people a make out of Dearborn? Because it 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 feels very very incredibly soft, but also it's very open, meaning that the their the introduction of moisture, for example, or stains, dyes, coffee. If I were to spill it on there, it seems like it will really absorb into that material into the Dearborn. Yeah. What are people making? Bags and shoes, and then we do have. I mean, we've that's that's like kind of like Essex is for. Dublin and other others. That's a, that's the base for other stuff. You so do we, a wax Dearborn. We do. We have. We do LaSalle as Dearborn mm, that's with right. finish on top of it. So it's still. I mean, the idea is to still keep it feeling good, but not have it like if you spill a red wine glass of red wine, it's not going to be like immediately stained. Have you seen a uh, Dearborn bag been that has been worn? Because I would imagine yeah. it really gets yeah. dirty looking. How does it look? No, it's, I mean it's like an, any other natural veg. Cool. I should try that. It's very soft, though. It looks probably no stand on a bag; it just kind of flops. I guess it depends on the the bag. liner. Or, yeah, know. it depends totally on the bag. But yeah, they're slouchy. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean they're they're really it's nice. They're really nice. They feel. I mean, the bags that I have seen that have been made out of that product have generally sell. I don't know how they. I've never seen one with a ton of wear, other than you know the few that we've that we've tried out. But they sell. They always end up. Not sticking around long because they feel you go and you feel it, and like it feels so nice. And I'm not sure people are thinking about how it's going to wear, but it feels nice. I kind of want to f- give another example here of how to. I'm I'm trying to use big vocabulary words <laughs> by accident. Well, just like a to elucidate the uh, difference between hide types. If you were to take the chromoxal tannage. And put that on different animal skins, uh, what the result would be. So, most commonly, is you're using that chromoxyl tannage on a bovine, but you can do it on horse. Have you done it on any other? I guess you've done it on bison. What's Ca- the calf? Calf. What's the result uh, from that tannage translated onto the different hide types? Outside of the, I mean, the, the phys, like the appearance of the grain that we were talking about and the thickness, and the, I guess what I'm getting at is, does the tannage translate consistently regardless of hide type? Does it give you the same product? Um, not exactly, because the uptake is different. Mm. The you know the certain, I mean, that, that, but that's that's the case from in between, even in between weights, and even different times of the year. I mean, it's it's highly variable, but yeah, I mean, that you could you could make four, take four different hide types and run them together at the same time and you would get four different they'd be the same product but it would have different you know one would be in terms of softness and in terms of the color would be definitely would be different in terms of how much material would would get taken up but i mean that's but that's our job is to take those take those you know four or five different types and then make adjustments to each one as it's going through to try to make it at the end as consistent as possible. Yeah. Even so, even when you're when you're comparing from type to type. Like irrespective of grain character, it does seem like there is some sort of magic happening in the fiber structures of each of the animals. Yeah. I mean a lot of it, I mean, a lot of that management will be how much material is going into it and how long it's being mm-hmm. how it's how long it's being run. And this is, I mean, this is any tannery is doing this. I mean, someone like I'm guessing, but someone like Stead, I mean, they're not running their their waterproof calf suede and their kudu side by side and getting the same exact result if they don't make any changes. I think that's pretty it's pretty common. Yeah. Makes sense. We started talking about tanges for Chrome Excel. 
are there specific tannages that you would not want to run on uh, on one animal type than another? Like for example, shell cordovan pit tanned. You can pit tan steer hides, but I don't know. Would you would you bother pit tanning a deer? Sure. Yeah. It's just the, it doesn't command. It doesn't for for whatever reason, right or wrong. It doesn't command the price. Mm. So you get a product, and the structure, the hide structure is so different. Where you know the piece of that the the shell in the cordovan product really needs all that additional time, and you you could run a different hide type exactly the same way. And at a certain point, it's just taking longer because you don't. It doesn't. The density of the product is, is lower. Or it's thinner or it doesn't need. It just doesn't need the kind of time that that does, and that's just an experience thing. I mean, they've they've oh, through the years said like, oh, can we pit tan for fifteen days, or does it need forty five, or does it need? You're talking you know, about for, set, for shell, for shell, or for anything. And mm-hmm. I think that I think that any tannery that's been around for a number of years and has traditional products, they've done the same thing. And you sort of end up like, well, you know, thirty is maybe three days too long or something, but you know, sometimes it needs that little extra time, so we're going to do it. 45, you end up getting a product that's too dark and it's taking longer. So, and if it's, if it's taking longer and not making it better, markedly better, yeah. then you're just, you're making sort of a bad business decision at that point. Yeah. I, f- I feel like I've had some conversations with your dad about leaving the horse hide intact and pit tanning the whole thing alongside the shells. And his ex- explanation for why you don't do that is the shell. Is special enough, and it takes a long time to do, and you can it commands a price premium, so it's worth the time. But you're spending all that material and time to tan the fronts, which have a lower clarity of the grain. It's like he's just like it's not a premium product like the Cordovan is, but uh, it's pretty nice. The pit tan horse, it is nice. Yeah. Well, and, and that's I mean, that's the the way the industry is. I mean, the nice the nice clean big hides of any kind. Are nice and clean and big and easy, and everybody wants them. Yeah. It's like, what do you do with all with the full product composition? How do you? I mean, and that's why a product mix is important. I mean, that's why tanneries don't just make one color of one thing because if you, I mean, you you need sort of a mix because you can you can sell the bigger, cleaner stuff generally for more because it commands a premium because it's there's less of it, and then the stuff that's not that needs maybe a little more finesse to use to be euphemistic. Well, like that some people just, like it, that, yeah. right? It's, yeah, they, they do. But I think that the, you know, the market for that is not, I mean, it's not, that's, there's not a big enough market. I don't think um, for to support, to support a, you know, the industry. Yeah, I get you. <sighs> it's complicated. Yeah. Oh, well, I think like, like I said, I know a lot about these things and I've worked there and I'm, Mildly confused, <laughs> just because it seems like uh, I. It, it seems like we're saying the hides are completely different, but you can kind of make them the same, and so it's all gray. This is the conclusion here. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's like it's. I get. I mean, it's like cooking. I mean, you can you can use different protein types in cooking and cook them exactly the same way, and you're going to get like a similar flavor profile at the end in, in some regards and in others it's going to be completely different i see cooking analogy i always go back to it i can't help it way to go <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah I, I was we talked about doing like a history of tanning episode at some point which i think we'll still do it but i started to do a little bit of a dive on that and confuse myself look so these, much look at these i confuse myself so much more about you have many leather bound books about Nick. tanning these i i, I talked to chris Goldlinger, who's the tanner at the tannery, the actual tanner, the chemist, and who's been his family's been tanning longer than my family's been tanning, but um, eight generations for Chris. Is it eight or six or it's eight? It's it's a long time back, starting in Austria. Yeah, eight. That's crazy. But he gave me. I was like, "Do you have any books? Any old books that aren't in German?" Because he went to tanning school in Germany mm-hmm. or in Austria. I can't remember, but he gave me these books, and I was reading through them, and it's so. They're so they're ones from eighteen ninety seven, ones from nineteen nineteen. And we'll when we do our our episode, I'll, we'll I'll, talk about them. We'll talk about them more. But they're maybe so, we can sneak preview what the titles of the books are. They're so tech. They're so technical. <laughs> Even it's like 
This one's just called leather manufacturer. Leather manufacturer. I, I just like, I like Give this. Give us an excerpt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> since the, the issue in 1897 of the fourth edition of this work, as revised by the author, rapid studies have been made in the leather industry. <laughs> so between 1897 and 1919, rapid changes have been made. And it goes on to say, like, I think there's a quote somewhere. I think it's this one, this is a 1919 one where like, like the, the viability of chrome tanning like remains to be seen in like very many products. Like they're saying it's good in certain products, but oh. not really, they're not sure if it'll be any good in other products. Interesting. And then they, they talk about um, tanning in different parts of the world and like who's good at what. I wonder how much of it's like propaganda too. I don't know. And the, <laughs> the uh, American, they, they're like the Americans are like, the Americans don't know what they're doing with Cordovan. Yeah. <laughs> like 1919. <laughs> Wow, that's probably a shot at your maybe. I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know. I didn't realize because I, I was trying to figure out like what, like when was was chrome tanning like first figured out? Eighteen like, something. Eighteen like sixties. Mm-hmm. And but they were saying that because you can tan with with aluminum too, and like this is you know different mineral tannage, and they were saying that that goes all the way back to the Saracens. What is that? I don't know. That's like. I don't know what that is. Like medieval, <laughs> not like a thousand years ago. Yeah, and I don't, and I don't know if they were, if they, if they knew that there was aluminum in the salts they were using or whatever. But I bet it's all trial and error stuff. They didn't have any way to know what they were doing. It just knew the result worked. Uh, you were talking about cordovan uh, not being well done in the United States hundred years ago. The so question I get a lot is, what's the difference between your cordovan? And other tanneries, Cordovan. Actually, maybe start with this. Do you know how many tanneries are producing a Shell Cordovan product today? Including us, like maybe five or six, I yeah. think. Um, there have been a couple tanneries that have been sold in like the recent past. So I'm not sure exactly what their status is. And then also some tanneries, tanneries, some leather sellers are buying and then finishing and then reselling them under a different name. Um, so I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if that would be considered tanning or not. No, I, no. In this definition, but it's nice. I mean, I want to know who's producing the actual material, right? Well, and, and I don't prefer to call anybody out. Yeah. But what I think would, it's like four or five would be for, it, under that. It's pretty interesting, right? Yeah. You would assume given the, I don't know how what the margins are in the Cordovan, but it's like a higher priced leather. You would assume a lot of people are trying to get into that in the leather business, but I wonder if it's just so specialty that, or so small um, of a like the output, <laughs> you get five square feet maybe on a maybe a high, yeah. on a big one, just maybe just a, too big of a challenge for them to mess with. But what are you doing differently? Because I've another YouTube video I did comparing all the Cordovan from around the world. I noticed a difference. I don't want to fluff your feathers too much, but I liked your product. There's some others that are nice too, um, but different. they're all they're all different. What what's going on that's making the same hide type again? Show Cordovan in this example. What's making them different from tannery to tannery? I mean, it's the, the the process is completely different. I mean, there's common there's common threads in any between any tannery in terms of like what the goal is, but you know, ours takes longer and We've been doing it the longest of the remaining tanneries that are left that I'm aware of. We we have the most experience, so like that in itself is is worth something. Just because I, I just realized that I'm putting you in a position to give up trade secrets. No, I that's okay. Okay, yeah. Don't <laughs> like you that. said, there's only there's only like other four <laughs> other guys in the world or four other people in the world that are doing it. So it's not like people are rushing to. Would you say there's a bunch of us. secrets in what you're doing that people don't know that you won't share? Um. Secrets in the formulations, I would, I think so, in the combinations and what we use and and the proportions. But I mean, it's such an old product, and we're not. You know, we weren't. There were a lot of people making cordovan at one point. Like people could figure out what you're doing. Maybe, yeah. I don't think. I think that. I think that. Maybe, regardless, uh, sorry. In, in the terms of like the actual processing, not the formulations, you think they could figure out what? I think so. I, I don't think it would be. I mean, because it, it's not. It's not totally off the wall. It's not totally, I mean, it's a veg tan, it's a pit tan leather. It's not, it's not like it's some magical 
thing that only exists in this one building in Chicago. I mean, you can do it in other places. I mean, the water chemistry is different. I mean, and the experience of the machinery we have is old and specialized. And, and, but I think that the experience and the patience is probably the most valuable part of the whole thing. I think that's one of the secrets, actually. I think when you mentioned the word patience, there's a process called currying, which is on your letterhead. Do you want to talk about currying or should we avoid this topic completely? No, it's fine. I, you it's gave just, me like a slight grimace. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's, it's just hand. It just means oiling by hand. But you have to let it cure. It's afterwards, it's the, yeah. The cooking but the analogy. currying itself is the brush, is the brushing. But yeah, so we, we brush by hand because the thickness, going back to hide type, the thickness is not uniform from one end of the shell to the other. So we can't, if we were to just feed it through a machine and put the same amount of oil on the whole hide, <clears throat> on the whole piece, it would be, you end up with darker and lighter parts and parts that were softer and other parts that were firmer. So it, it needs, it, it needs a hand application to make it more uniform. But, but yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, it's, I guess, it's, it's an experience thing. I, I think, think that, of it as patience in the, in that handwork is much more cost intensive in terms of time uh, to, to apply. But also after it's curried, you have to, to let those oils even out over a course of several months, which I think a lot of people don't appreciate how doing nothing is very valuable. Uh, I've noticed some leather that I've had sitting in my shop for 10 years. We bought some stuff for a project years ago in Chrome Excel. And as that leather has sat, it's become better. Maybe we want to talk about that patience in, <laughs> in the tanner. You're like, why can't you pump out cordovan faster? We could it just wouldn't be nice yeah it wouldn't be the same and i mean the the but the it's it's a you have to resist the temptation and like and i think that the other veg tanneries like herman oak and the, the uh rendenbach when they were around i guess they're still around to some extent i mean they, they they're doing the same thing where you you know, it takes us long because it takes us long and that's what makes that's part of what makes the product and to try to rush it you're going to you're going to change the product it's not going to be the quality is going to suffer um at least in the application that it's intended for so yeah so it's easy I mean, you can cut the tannage down to in, in half and rush it and you'll end up with something that's just not as good we're falling into the trap that we fall into all the time, which is talking about how the stuff is done and not talking about the result. Oh, okay. But would, no, no, no. Would you? <laughs> yeah. This is my fault. Yeah. Would you say that by not speeding it up is what's setting your product apart from the other Cordovan tanneries? What is different about your that's part material? Of it. Yeah. yeah. I think. I mean, I think that that's, the process is different. I mean, how? I mean, they they have the same raw materials are available to everybody in terms of tree barks and dyes and all that stuff. It's just how do you, how do you put it together? And it's like, well, the one thing that my um, dad says, is like, it's not, it's not complicated, but it's not simple either. Like it just, you just have to be deliberate and take the right approach or take, I mean, right being in the eye of the beholder, I guess, but you know, it's, it's just, just different, just different ways of doing the same thing. And, you know, and that, and that yields different, you know, how many times can you turn your inventory over and what's the price, the, the price per foot at the, at the very end, you know, and both of those things inform to a certain extent, who's going to be able to use the product, who's going to want to use the product or the scalability of the product. Or, you know, the, I think that the, the slow, the long processing time is, is a barrier for a lot of people. I mean, who is, no one's interested in modern days of saying, okay, so we're going to make this product. It takes six months. I mean, outside of like, wine and whiskey. I mean, who is signing up for, for like a long aging process or any long lead time? We're in, we're in a world of instant gratification. Um, is your product more expensive? Your Cordovan? Yeah. By a significant amount or I don't know. I think, cause I see, I mean, the, I, it's hard for me to, I, I, I said yes, it. <laughs> I said yes quickly, but when I go, you know, you see you know, curiosity going on, see like, well, what are they selling? Well, they're selling one or two pieces at a time. Like the per foot price is not really indicative, so I guess I guess I don't exactly know. Mm -hmm. I guess I don't exactly. Know. So if I laid out the five, let's assume all five different chill quarter of tanneries in front of you, have you seen them in person? The other, mm -hmm, yeah. What would you say is the difference between all of these that we've laid out? 
other than color? Let's say they're all the same color. Let's say they're all uh, natural. Th- thickness, s- smell. Actually, color is a good one because the finishing is mm-hmm. from the shells I've seen from other places are, are much uh, more varied and different yeah. than what you're doing. Yeah. So thickness, smell, the texture, how smooth or how waxy does it feel? The temper. So how if, if you flex it, how soft is it? When you flex it, does it feel? Does it feel like? Can you compress it and make it feel thin, or does it feel like robust and, and sort of beefy? No pun intended. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of like well, all like, of the what's aspects. The, what's of, the difference with yours in all those characteristics? It's very. It's well. I don't feel know. like I want to help you so bad, but I'm going to let you. I'm <laughs> no, gonna let you no, I'm your, trying. I'm trying not to say shit. like like. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I think we do it the right way because that's the way we do it. And I don't, but that I'm not, I'm also not saying that I think everyone else does it the wrong way. I just think it's, I just think it's different. I just right. think, I think ours is nice because I've been brainwashed to think that. Well, what do you like about it? That's different than what they're doing. It's, it's, it's round. So it has like that, that full feeling to it. It's smooth and consistent and it's smaller in terms of footage, but it's smaller because we've trimmed away all the non, shell area so it's in that regard it's consistent more consistent even though you might be getting a smaller amount of it and i mean it takes longer i think the i think we do we're pretty I mean, even though we're not that consistent with the colors i think we're pretty consistent with the colors given what we're working with and how we're doing it the finishing style is different too and i appreciate your more natural inclination of how you guys have been doing for a hundred years it's it's very natural looking regardless of color even on the blacks that it that's an interesting thing i think of black leather is how you can critique a tannery or a, a finishing department in a tannery because mm-hmm. it's very easy to have the natural sense to just paint it but getting that sort of aniline black that has some depth to it but you still want it to be black i think is a way that you could tell one tannery to another. But, you know, it's black. <laughs> I like your black shells because it, it is very much a natural-looking black and doesn't look like paint. I've seen some shells that look crazy painted, which seems like an absolute waste to me. I don't understand why you would do that and not just put it on a deer skin. In that example. You could cover up all that coarse grain. I mean, it's dense. You get the density of the product, but, yeah, it's not. It seems wasteful. You're not taking full advantage of the, or at least I don't think you're taking full advantage of the of the material that you've that you've started to work with. The, the big one that you mentioned too is sort of um, there's two th- two bits of feel to me. It's the, the if you brush your finger across the top, is it smooth or does it have like a little bit of grabbiness to it? I feel like you're the the way that you guys have processed the shells have created a result that's smoother than most other shells. There are some that do a good job too, but I feel like yours is smoother. But also the, like you said, the roundness. There's an interesting thing that's very difficult to describe in words, but the that roundness we talk about, where it's got a body to it that is soft, but also has snaps back to your hand. I think we've talked about it in the podcast before. It's yours a, has it's a, a density thing. It's like your the feel is so much. Um, more pleasant in yours. Some other cordovan that I have felt is much more boardy. Like it feels literally like um, the temper of cardboard where it doesn't want to move. And it just, it kind of feels empty too. And it's been explained to me by your salesperson. So of course, very biased, but he, John sees a good amount of leather. And he, he said to me once that Horween puts so much stuff into the leather. That's what sets it apart is the amount of stuff that goes into your tanning and retanning and in addition to that your dad has told me he feels like your retanning and tanning are the strength of the business he thinks that's the, the thing that sets you guys apart or do yeah. you, you agree yeah retanning our retanning formulas are, what is it about that was uh, it like would you consider stuffing hot stuffing to be part of the retanning it, i mean yes it, it isn't what it is i mean because you're you're it's when you're hot stuffing it's kind of like you're splitting retanning into two different processes into two different drums because you're going to use one uses water and one doesn't but you can also retan without hot stuffing using emulsified waxes and greases it just gives you a different wet stuffings 
Yeah. Or fat liquoring. It's kind of, you're getting, it's, it's achieving your, your conditioning that you're just not using, you're using refined products, which just gives you a different end result. We do a lot of that too. Um, but yeah, why I mean, wouldn't everybody do that? Why wouldn't everybody use the same things that you guys are doing? I mean, is it the obvious, like, oh, it's expensive kind of thing? Yeah, it's expensive and they're inconsistent and it takes longer. And yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's all those things. I mean, you, can, you, we still buy a lot of stuff and, and then, and other people do this too. You can buy it, you can have companies do this for you where they blend it for you and it, you know, becomes it's a different thing by just the nature of, combining it before it goes into something else. And that's just an extra step that costs. And it's not, I mean, you can do that or not do that, but we, you know, if, if we think it makes us better than, than we tend to do it, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, retail, I think any leather is what it is because of the retail. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the canvas because the, the chrome tanning, the veg tanning, whatever the base tinge is. I mean, it can be, it can, it does vary quite a bit. But it's still giving you a base, and then the retange is really what separates one leather from the next, and gives you because I mean, you can do you can finish it stuff a bunch of different ways. What you end up doing to the surface uh, is dependent on what you've done before. But really, if you don't have a solid base or a base that is going to give you the performance, it doesn't really matter what you do to the surface. All right, so you have tanages and retanages. How many tanages do you have, and how many retanages do you, could you spitball that you have? <laughs> How many tannages? It's so the base tannage. Yeah, base tannage. Four. Four. And then retanages, it's hundreds, thousands. Yeah, hundreds. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, they're not all active all the time, but. Uh, this is why this is a pr- confusing topic. Yeah, it's, previous guest, <laughs> Brett Viberg, was in town recently and he's like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> Way too many products, <laughs> too many tannages. He's kind of right. I mean, it's not wrong, but. Uh, I mean, they're all they're all variations. You're a lot an of idiot, Brett. <laughs> a lot of them, a lot of them are variations on uh, on a theme too. But it's not wrong. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's complicated to keep track of all that different all that different stuff. Yeah, it, it, I feel like this is going to be a confusing episode for people to digest because each of these topics that we start to go into are deep dives. Like you could write one of these one of these books. About people it. did, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So I I think we should pick some of those and go deeper to like on a microscopic level, what's the difference between the, the hide structure in a horse versus bovine, right? It's like, there's probably a different, like the fibers probably go different directions and maybe they're, we should explore that. It'd be kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated, it's the, the whole, the industry in general is complicated. The processing is complicated. And I think that, I think any industrial process where you're making something has a lot of inputs and potential inputs and, and variations to it. But when you're taking, when you've got the very base that's completely different every single time because it's you know from a natural product, it just makes it that much more right. crazy and complicated. I'm just I'm just hoping that having like little conversations like this will help people understand just a little bit more. And then as we keep having more conversations, like oh, it, it makes sense finally. All right, let's move on to favorites. Wrap it up here, Nick. Do you want to start with favorites? Um, sure. What do you got? What do you love? Let me, you actually, you want me to start because you're never ready. <laughs> All right, let's go. Wait, I've got, I've got it. <laughs> I, I've got it. Uh, I started listening to uh, books. Oh, another book because that's I never have time to sit down and read. It seems like, but it's a it's a book on World War One, which is like pretty a pretty heavy, complicated topic. It's called A World Undone. And I'm really enjoying it. It's like, I did not realize how complicated and sort of political, I mean, obviously it's political and how much intrigue there was going leading up into that. War. But it's, I think that, I think that uh, I got really interested because Dan Carlin, the hardware history guy, I think, I think he's the one that said that the, that the start of that, War, so like the assassination of the Archduke. Even though that, if you th- re- even like just read the f- listen to the first hour of this book, there's so much more complicated than that. Hmm. Called that as like one of the most important events in like human history, like wow. how much it changed the world and culture and everything. So, I think that I think that the as a historical event that that it sort of gets overshadowed by the Second World War. But 
It's it's really interesting. World War One is crazier than World War Two. G. J. Meyer is the author of that book. Um, no, I think it's less. I think it's less crazy actually. If you think, look at the numbers and think about the conditions and because the yeah because the the second one was a result of the first. Yeah. Books. I got a book. G. J. Meyer, check it out. What's it called again? A world undone. A, wor- a world. Cool. But only if you like super dense. <laughs> How is it told? Is it is it uh, just like a textbook kind of thing? Or no, I mean it's it's pretty dense. I mean it's not it's it's not like fact 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 fact. But it's yeah. pretty Li- very linear. Yes, very. And, I like, I mean, linear. like the, the first <laughs> the first part of the book. It's like July nineteenth to July twenty first because there's that much happening in like the first three weeks. So I mean he like it's really broken down. Okay, I'm gonna check it out. Now, I got a book too. I haven't finished it yet. And you may recall from one of the first episodes, is really into Project Hail Mary, which <laughs> I've probably listened to another time since we last talked. It's my put myself to to bed. Yeah, I remember you saying that sort of book. And uh, I love that book. I was asking a friend for sci-fi book recommendations. He actually recommended that book, and I go, I've <laughs> been there a few times. And our buddy Arjun. Uh, he said you should check out the three body problem, which is uh, I'm doing audiobooks too. It's a um, it's a book written by a Chinese so author. I gotta, I gotta, so I go. Oh, you got to go right now. Yeah, I just I, I have to get Gabriel on. All right, well, I have to get him a twelfth. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Nick's leaving in the middle of my beautiful explanation. <laughs> Edit this out, Phil. No, no, I'm leaving I, this one in. I forgot that I have to go. See that you, Nick. Far. You got to go really far. Oh, I forgot what time it was. This is my fault, everybody. We'll finish this up myself. I don't need a co-host. <laughs> All right, Three Body Problem is a book written by a Chinese author. I haven't finished it yet, but it, it seems like it's going to uh, turn out to be like a really interesting sort of like alien kind of coming to earth sci-fi book, but I don't know enough about it yet. There's some interesting like... It's sort of like a hard sci-fi where they go really deep on, uh, again, like physics and how f- the physics in this story uh, may be changing from day to day is pretty pretty crazy and I'm enjoying it so far. So check out uh, Three Body Problem, guys. Nick, see you later. Bye. He's still in the room. Everybody else, thanks for, so much for checking out the episode today. Until next time, hope you have a good one. <laughs>